how and today I'll be demystifying the bracket notation used in quantum mechanics. So perhaps you're a third year undergrad student and you have just taken a course in quantum mechanics and you recognize the time dependent and time independent Schrodinger equation and you have heard that psi is the eigenstates or eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian operator which is a differential operator and E is the eigen energies or the eigenvalues of this operator and you need to solve this partial differential equation uh, to get the behavior of the wave function which describes the quantum system. However, you might have also been hit with this new notation where they use uh, this, not this, this thing known as the bracket notation to represent the quantum state. And you might be wondering why you need to use the bracket notation and what purpose it serves to describe quantum mechanics. You might have also seen the following expressions where um, the quantum state expressed in momentum space is written as such, or you might have seen the identity expressed as projections onto the eigenstates. If you study quantum computing, you might see the expression spin up and spin down like this often, perhaps to describe electrons or perhaps to describe polarization. And you might be confused uh, what the bracket notation, what, what the bra cat notation really means and what a quantum state really is. Well, um, in summary, linear algebra is a tool that is used in quantum mechanics and the bracket notation is a neat way to represent ideas of linear algebra, namely the cat represents a vector in the Hilbert space and the, ra and the bra represents a linear functional in the Hilbert space. So let's just have a quick crash course on linear algebra in case you're not familiar with um, the notions in linear algebra. So you might have heard of vectors and you might think of them as arrows or as columns of numbers and then perhaps you can operate on these vectors with matrices which are, is a table of numbers. However, these notions are not precise in the context of abstract linear algebra. So, uh, the, no the definition of a vector space is actually more general than columns of numbers. So, a vector space is defined as a set which has two operations, addition and scalar multiplication. These operations, namely addition and scalar multiplication, must satisfy certain properties. These eight properties must be satisfied in order for you to call the set a vector space. So in essence, you have a set of elements and the set of elements behave in a certain way under addition and multiplication and then you can promote it, promote this set of elements to be a vector space. So one such example that we're all very familiar with is the R3 vector space where, it's, where we can say that an element of this R3 vector space is a column of three numbers. Then we define addition of the column of three numbers as such and scalar multiplication as such. You, you might be familiar with R3 because we live in Euclidean R3 space. However, there's also more general vector spaces that we can consider. And one such example is the vector space of functions. So if you think of a function f, and a function g, you can think of, and we let's say that there's an addition in the vector space of functions, and this addition is defined as such, where if you take the function f plus a function g, how this new function f plus g behaves is defined by pointwise addition, namely this new function behaves when it when when it takes in a variable x, it spits out f x plus g of x. I denote I use the subscript V and subscript R here to emphasize that the addition over here is the addition in the functions vector space, whereas the addition here is the addition in the real numbers. And they must be the distinction is important. If not, we'll be confusing ourselves. Likewise, we can also define scalar multiplication of a function. As such, where this is the scalar multiplication in the function vector space, and this is the scalar multiplication in the real numbers. So, 
I hope this is a good example that illustrates how a vector space can be more general than just columns of numbers. In essence, any set that any set of elements that satisfies these properties, you might have heard of as Kanu, Kenny, and Adu. Any set of elements that satisfies these properties can be called a vector space. And the tools of linear algebra can be used on that set of elements. So the upshot of this is that quantum mechanics is linear, and hence we can use the tools of linear algebra in quantum mechanics. So the Schrodinger equation is a linear differential equation. So if you have one solution to the Schrodinger equation, psi1, and another solution, psi2, then psi1 plus psi2 is a solution as well. So you can sense the linearity in quantum mechanics, and hence I hope this is convincing why linear algebra can be used in quantum mechanics. So what is the vector space that we use in quantum mechanics? The answer is we use Hilbert spaces. So examples of uh, so Hilbert spaces in, in you might have heard of linear algebra as matrices of numbers, but that is most likely in the case of finite dimensional vector spaces. But it's important to note that Hilbert spaces can be infinite dimensional. So um, sometimes it does not even make sense to write down a, a column vector of numbers to represent your quantum state because if you need to write down infinite number of numbers, then you, you can't do it. So the, that's where the importance of uh, ab the abstract notion of a vector space comes in because we simply cannot write down a quantum state as a list of numbers. We need to deal with it more abstractly and that's where abstract linear algebra comes in. So um, the, the exact Hilbert space that we deal with depends on the quantum mechanics problem. So yeah, in the case of spin, it is a finite dimensional complex vector space, whereas for position and momentum states, it's similar to the, func the functions vector space that we talked about previously. So when you have a vector space, it's important, it's often useful to talk about the notion of a basis. So um, when you see the cat vector over here, it is a vector in the is an element or is a vector of the Hilbert space. So the quantum state is described by this vector, this cat vector. You might think that the most fundamental description of the quantum state is the wave function perhaps, but um, it's better to think of the more fundamental object as, the, as a state vector, the quantum state, which is a vector in the Hilbert space. Then when you project this vector onto a certain basis, such as the position basis, then you get the wave function, which is essentially the components of the vector. So just like um, in, the, in three dimensions, you have three basis vectors, right? So in quantum mechanics, you can have infinitely many basis vectors. And then when you want to express a quantum state in terms of the basis, you project it onto the basis. So in this case, so in that sense, you can get a position wave function or you can get a momentum wave function. And these are both two different ways of representing the two different representations of the quantum state in different bases. So ultimately, the more fundamental object over here is the quantum state, the vector, the cat vector, which is, and what is that? There's a vector in the Hilbert space. And the wave functions are merely components when you project this quantum state, this vector, onto its basis. So are these the only bases that are available? No. It turns out that eigenstates of self-adjoint operators form bases as well. And this is owing to the spectral theorem from linear algebra. So examples of self-adjoint operators also include the Hamiltonian operator, the spin the spin operator and the angular momentum operator. So in the angular like for example an angular momentum operator you might see the spherical harmonics. So that is an example of a basis. There's also a notion of inner product when it comes to quantum mechanics and that is because Hilbert space is a vector space with an inner product. 
and this inner product takes in two cat vectors and it spits out a complex number. So you might see the inner product being defined as such. In the case of three dimensions, this would be what the inner product looks like. So it takes in um, a vector A and a vector B and it spits out a complex number. Then you can think of the bra as the row vector and the cat B as the column vector. Then this is just given by vector multiplication. Or you might also see it as def defined as an integral when there is when you are expressing it in an infinite dimensional basis. Likewise, um, you might also see the conjugate transpose in in in, in uh, quantum mechanics, and you might see that a cat vector can be conjugate transpose written as a dagger. This this called a dagger to become a bra vector and vice versa. And this is also due to the Ries representation theorem, which basically states that um, this transformation is unique because what we have on the left is actually a vector in the Hilbert space, but what we have on the right is actually a, is actually a linear functional. So um, the, the correspondence between vector and linear functional is is one to one according to the Ries representation theorem. So just note that when you take the conjugate transpose. There's also linear operators used in quantum mechanics which takes in a certain state vector and spits out the state vector. So this can be used to represent physical observables or transformations on your state vector. You can also define linear operators on the bra vector sorry not bra vector on the bra um yeah you can also define because the, the bra is not a vector sorry sorry about that so you can also define linear operators on the bra and define it as such or you can or you might have seen outer products which are also linear operators and when acting when when working in finite dimensional vector spaces the outer product can be thought of as a matrix so on the left hand side you have a cat on the right hand side you have a bra and then the cat is a column vector the bra is a row vector and by matrix multiplication you get a matrix so overall um, the bracket notation is a useful tool to describe quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics uh, makes use of linear algebra and the bracket notation encapsulates a lot of ideas of linear algebra to make calculations more easy in quantum mechanics um, if you want to study the mathematical foundation behind quantum mechanics, you can check out this YouTube place over here and it mainly deals with Hilbert spaces and yeah and, and Hilbert space is the space that quantum mechanics deals with. However, if you're not keen on um, learning the mathematical foundation, which can be quite daunting if that's the first time you're dealing with abstract maths, then what I recommend to do is if you just want to master the bracket notation then just learn the rules and apply its rules and that way you should be able to get through most of the physics questions in your course so yeah i hope that this video helps you get a better understanding of the grand picture of things where linear algebra is used in quantum mechanics and hence justifying the use of bracket notation to simplify our equations or make them neater um yeah i hope this has helped so if not, uh, that's all I have to today. Have a nice day.